Oh boy, episode number eight is not off to a hot start. This has bad vibes, bad feelings. It is really, really hard to be positive about the New York Mets right now after the absolutely embarrassing series against what is a shell of their former team, the Chicago Cubs. I like, we normally have our little intro here. I like to be a little happy. I like to get a little excited. I mean, James is a new place. Where is James? That's a little game we always play on the podcast. He's somewhere else today. But it's just really hard not to start it off and be honestly pissed off. Like, it's it's really, really bad baseball, and I just don't feel great today. Yeah, anger, frustration, annoyance. I don't know. I'm, I'm just pissed off. I can't even think of good enough words right now because my brain just isn't functional because I just all the bad baseball I just watched over the last three days have killed me. Yeah, so this is going to be a little bit of a different episode for you guys. It's not going to be our cheery, happy selves because it's just, after what we just watched, it's really, really hard to honestly find any positives because there was very few to pick from. The, and the, only, the only positive the Mets can take from this is that they have a game tomorrow, that, that the best pitch pitcher in baseball is pitching because there's nothing I can take from 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 these from these last three days what an absolute unmitigated disaster the Mets series in Chicago has been and they even flash the stats tonight at the end of the game the Mets are like 15 and 38 15 and 40 something ridiculous like that in Wrigley Field for the last 18 years historically those, bad those are some fucking bad Cubs teams why can't the Mets beat the Cubs in Wrigley basically the only time we beat the Cubs in Wrigley was during the NLCS yeah which, 2015 I mean, playoffs worth it Worth it. Worth it. But also, like, I would love to win a game against the weak and anemic Chicago Cubs because this team is a terrible team. Now, before we... Because we're going to rant. There's going to be rants. Let me do our little spiel here. Where to find us. Instagram, Twitter. You haven't stuff. even told them where to find us yet. I know. It's we're three minutes in. a few minutes. minutes. Holy we're three shit. minutes in, and we haven't even said what our Instagram and Twitter is. Messed up. We're doing a good job over there. Make sure you're following us, and you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google. You can watch us on YouTube. It might be a good watch today. You might yeah, want to watch, good watch this Yeah, you see my hair is a little bit more ridiculous than usual because I've been freaking out and just going like this all day. Yeah, drinks have been had. Stress has been. I, I poured myself a little cup here, a little little rum and coke because uh, little red, little red solo. <laughs> it's about the only thing that can get me through watching this Mets game. It is bad. We have a ton of notes and a ton to talk about. This is more than we've ever filled up the Google Doc, and honestly, it's because of how bad it's been. It's not for good reasons. No, it's bad stuff. Usually, we have a couple fun stats in there, a couple positives, things to look forward to, things we've noticed. This, this is just us being. Plainly upset. This was not. This was not a beer and wine series. This was a brown liquor series. This. I literally poured myself some dark spiced rum because it's. I'm feeling dark and gloomy today. Where this is not a happy podcast. Fuck that. Let's jump right into the game we just watched. Game three of the series. The Mets facing a sweep. Come out with Joey Lucchese on the mound. And at this point, everyone should be aware across baseball, because it's been years now, Joey Lucchese is simply whatever. There's no words used to describe Joey Lucchese than whatever. He's never going to be better than you think. He might be okay. He'll throw you some innings. He'll compete. But the guy is just fucking whatever. He's just simply whatever. He has no good pitches, two okay pitches. Doesn't even have a third bad pitch that he could mix in. He wins with deception. So after one time through the lineup, you have to take him out. And it's just like... I know it, today doesn't the outcome of this game had little to do with him, but I just it it's hard to get up for a game that Joey Lucchese is starting. Yeah, he gave us an opportunity to win today, and maybe that's about the, no, he, one, yeah, of, he, one of two positives from the game. Super duper, whatever. But your point of yeah, like I mean, I, I giggled a little bit when you're like he's he's just he pitches and that's about it. Like that is Joey Lucchese, and I think we we both talked about during the game we were texting each other like he's the perfect opener because one time through the lineup he can be completely fine great yeah every single time that he gets to the second part of that or second time around the lineup they start to figure him out because it's just hard to be successful in this league when you throw 92 straight and your second pitch is like the churv which let's be honest like a little bit of a gimmick again deception is his big thing if he gets in the slightest bit of trouble he's pretty predictable and that happened a little bit early in the game. Still not his fault why we lost this no, game. No, not his fault why he lost and this game. Definitely gotta not. got to give some credit to Sean Reed Foley making his first ever Mets appearance. And he really stepped up for this team, gave us three innings in relief, and looked fine. He's going to be fine. Reed Foley was an absolute godsend in this game. I was sitting here vexed as to who was going to follow Lucchese in this game. It didn't seem like there was much of a plan. And, of course, Reed Foley got called up today, so that was definitely their plan that I was just too stupid to see. That's bound to happen. But thank God he was actually able to settle in and give us three legitimately good innings after Lucchese. I don't think there's much of a difference between these three guys' like stuff. I wouldn't say either of them is good or bad. 
if you would have swapped them, I'm sure Reed Foley would have gotten into trouble early, and then Lucchese would have came in, firemanned it late. But average stuff, just thank God he got through three clean innings. It actually gave us a chance to give us a chance to win this game. And the thing I really liked about Reed Foley, too, and is that he just came out throwing strikes. He came out attacking batters. And when you're a team that's already down early in the game, you can't afford to just be putting more guys on for free when you're down by a bunch of runs because you're just going to give up a couple runs. That's how it is. You have to start playing defense a little more aggressive. So I, he did fine. He kept us close, which helped a little bit. We got some helped. runs. I'd say, I'd say it helped a lot. I think that if, <laughs> if it would have been like, you know, another Hildenberger explosion to come in the middle innings to try and save us for... Two or three, two or three frames, we would have been out of this game. But again, Reed Foley, I, I would even go as far to call him the MVP of the game. <laughs> as crazy as that is to say, even though this game doesn't warrant one. Yeah, the guy who gave us three innings and didn't let up any runs and allowed for you know us to chip back a little bit. We got the Pete Alonso homer, and that's something that we put in the notes is that he's really starting to heat up. We're seeing it. I think they even mentioned he only struck out twice. I think in the series which is really big because last episode we mentioned it, his strikeout rate has been through the roof higher than it's really ever been. So it's good to see that that's evening out and the power numbers starting to come back. He hit two mammoth home runs this series, including tonight. Yeah, and dude, you know what's funny? The hardest hit ball that he had this series was the ground out today. And I think it was the fifth or sixth inning. It was 117 off the bat. Hard, hardest ball he hit here. He's looking better. And I think also, did you text me this? Or I see it, or maybe in the notes, but I think Pete Alonso has the highest DRS among Mets fielders right yeah, now. Yeah, he does. He does two. right now, which is outrageous. But and then like he so he hit that big home run. We had a little bit of an inning where we got to Trevor Williams, which by the way, like you have to get to Trevor Williams. You have to get to Trevor Williams. He's just not a good pitcher. Dude, Williams, Williams led this game in whiffs. Trevor Williams should never, ever be the, the sole proprietor of the most swing and misses in any type of baseball game, almost at any level. It's ridiculous. He had 14 swings and misses. For him, that's like Godly. The Mets, Mets at bats were atrocious. And I mean, we saw Conforto get one off the, the wall, well, off the fence, the top of the friggin' bucket or yeah. basket, whatever that is. Since, I, I mean, thought since, since when is the yellow line not a home run? Is that, it was, uh, since when, is, <laughs> when can you even hit that thing? I, I hate that it hangs out over the field. Dude, it, the got way, hit, it got hit multiple times today, like at least twice. Yeah, JD hit it again late in the game. Yeah. Dom and hit then, it. I think Brian might have hit it too. Brian hit. I mean, there was just balls being peppered off the left field, like, or left center gap. We got a little bit on him. But then we let the we let off the brakes, and I know Rojas is trying to do something a little different today, trying to mix it up. But having VR and Pilar in the lineup next to each other is two automatic outs. And when you only have a certain amount of innings played in a baseball game, you can't be giving away basically two thirds of an inning every single time those guys come up. I wouldn't say those guys are automatic outs. They both put the bat on the ball. I mean, VR has put the bat on the ball recently. Today he took some pretty dog shit at bats but that's just that's a Jonathan VR experience that's what you sign up for yeah I think that comes back to the whole thing of like he's a great pinch hitter because you have to let him get up there and kind of be like a chicken without his head like just go up there and just start hacking away but I don't think he, that's the right idea <laughs> but when he like has to like kind of be a real baseball player he he even had a 2-0 swing today on a slider that was like low in the dirt and I was like dude 2 yeah, was oh, terrible you're in, the, you're in the driver's seat what are dude, you doing also Pete Pilar there wasn't that bat he had with a man on or two men on late in the game. I forgot exactly what the situation was. And he had the line out or the hard ground ball, second, short, first, somewhere in the infield. And he, like, was crashing his bat on the on the holder. Like, there's some real frustration coming over this team right now. They're playing frustrating baseball. It's frustrating to watch. I can only imagine how frustrating it is for them. Like, they obviously don't want to play this way. They're obviously trying to get hits. And I think this kind of leads into the whole problem right now that the Mets are having is they are playing so incredibly tight. They're playing so, like, they had, they put so much pressure on themselves. When you think about, like, the 2019 Mets when they made the run at the end of the year, even though we didn't make the playoffs, that was a team that was playing loose. They were playing as the underdogs. They were playing, like, as a team. It was just a very good vibes. And right now, I know it's because we're not playing good baseball. It's hard to be, you know, loud and smiling and stuff when you're playing, like, absolute dog shit. But at the same time, that's what the Mets need to do. This team needs to loosen up a little bit because they're going up to the plate. And you even saw it in the last inning of the game. I know I'm jumping around a little bit. But the at-bats against Dan Winkler were atrocious. Awful. He oh, my God. Th he threw maybe, what, five actual strikes that inning? Maybe? Dude, it was terrible. He came in, like, to use the phrase you just used, he came into that inning like a chicken without his head. The first two baseballs weren't even remotely close to the strike zone. The Mets had a man on third with nobody outs after his first pitch, wild pitch of the inning, and McNeil still chased a high fastball 2-0. It was borderline, I guess, and McNeil's generally an aggressive hitter, but that was just not that was just not good pitch selection. No, and you text me, you're like, he's got to take there, and I originally said, like, I'm okay with it because it hasn't been working. But then you watch the rest of the inning and you do think about how Dan Winkler started it off. 
you got you got to you got to take there because Dan Winkler take a strike didn't have it for what four batters he walked the bases loaded and then Dom Smith hit into a ground ball double play which for the love of God can we hit the ball in the fucking air yeah, one time I don't even please, know. please he put that ball, the ball in the air he hit that ball in the nose just right fucking at them God the, the amount of like ground balls that we're seeing like our hard outs are ground balls or line drives right to people I don't know how we haven't found a gap in what feels like forever. But we're just hitting the ball really hard at people, and it's getting us outs, and we can continue not to hit with runners in scoring position. Like, oh my god, it's just, it's so, I'm not worried, but I am. Like, I'm worried because, like, oh my god, is this what the season's going to be like? 14 games in, and it's felt like the longest season I've ever experienced as a Mets fan. But also, at the same time, I know that these guys are good. Dom Smith's a good player. Conforto's good. McNeil's good. Francisco Lindor is good. All the guys we have are good players. They're just collectively somehow all playing like crap at the exact same time. I think that it's also in everyone's head now. We've kind of been using this rhetoric for a few weeks that these guys are pretty aware of what's going on. This team has had a lot of publicity in the offseason. There's a lot of pressure on them. There's a lot of money was spent. It's a lot. I don't, the, the Mets Conge- uh, contingency on Twitter is one of the strongest of any sports team that exists in the world. And there's just a lot of talking, talking, talking all day about this team. That's what happens when you're a team in New York. There's a lot of eyes on you. You're in the spotlight. They've put almost like a target on their backs now after the way they have spoken about themselves over the course of this early season. And it seems like teams really like playing, like just really want to beat them. The Cubs, the Cubs acted like they won the World Series after the series. Like it's a team that you could tell they've been struggling. They were talking shit. They were. Ha- they looked like they were having fun, which, like, I would love to see the Mets have a little bit of fun. This is a team that's supposed to have this big The Cubs haven't had fun in years. They These guys look be. tight every day. They're a horrendous team, but they absolutely embarrassed the Mets, and today was just a further pro- point of it. I mean, it's just like at any point in the game, you can find something that went wrong. Pilar and Conforto not catching that fly ball in the outfield. I that mean, was ridiculous. What? Kevin Pilar, you're the center fielder. You got to call him off. You have to call him off. That is your ball. The fact that that ball wasn't caught by anybody is embarrassing. And that play still worked out because ball don't lie. We got the double play the next pitch, but that's just that's that's day one stuff. That's fundamental shit right there. Like I just catch a fly ball. Like you're the center fielder, take charge. And Pilar's out there because he is a defensive guy. If he's gonna be our defensive replacement center fielder, I have to see him make the plays that he's supposed to. That's one of those plays that he didn't. And I know he's not the same center fielder that he once was. That's something me and you both said, and that's why we're like he's great as our fourth or fifth guy, not as a starter. Today, it showed why he's not the same Kevin Pillar that he once was in Toronto because that ball just simply has to be caught. Yeah, and Nimmo apparently has a stiff hip, so they've been keeping him out a few games here, and it's been cold, so that's even worse for stiff muscles, especially for playing defense, which I guess is why he was the first guy off the bench. Where are, we're 14 games into the season. Pilar's had 24 plate appearances, and he has looked pretty bad in most of them really bad i put it i saw your little reply to what i put in the notes but i just go he's a defensive replacement that's it and even then he looked like shit today out there i've had enough of him and it's true like i don't i don't want to cross people off my list right now because it is way too early to overreact but i'm sorry i need to overreact a little bit it's been a stressful week of watching mets baseball i need to just vent i know in a couple weeks it's gonna be fine and i'm gonna probably have something positive to say about kevin pilar but right now there's not much positive to talk about with him Especially because of how much he is getting to play. I know, and it, he, it, like, you want to keep guys fresh. The more innings you're on the field, the more likely it is you're being injured. So if you have a good backup and you can put him in there, you're mitigating some risk. But I don't know. The Mets, uh, he just can't. The guy's just not hitting. He's not hitting. And the frustration, as I said before, is boiling over for a guy like that who's working on a one year deal. He's been bouncing around the league for a few years, backs against the wall. And the worst part about it, the worst fucking part about it, is we looked across the field and Jake, goddamn Marisnik, was getting hits. Are you kidding me? Don't you get me started on putting in loop in the eighth inning, which it ended up again working. No, out, I was. I think. I think we, we've talked a lot about the bats. We should transfer a little bit to pitching and decision making right now because throwing loop in the eighth inning was absolutely a nonsensical move by Luis Rojas, mess management, whoever made that freaking call. That is dumb, dumb as fuck. The only lefty was there. Even, I don't think there even was a lefty to up that inning because Marisnik's a right-handed the, bat. The only positive outcome they had was that Ian Happ against left-handed pitching does worse. He's like a 750 OPS guy where he's like normally like 850 against righties, 900-ish. But in the same regards, it's Aaron Loop. If we have our best, if we have a Miguel Castro or Edwin Diaz going up against, uh, or even Trevor May going up against Ian Happ, I still like my odds. I still like my odds a lot. Thank God that Castro was able to pitch and be effective after he was used yesterday when 14 runs were already on the board. But I guess we'll touch on that when we get more to game two. But even though the result was good, the process was bad. 
bringing Loop in that eighth inning. It was bad. It was bad. And even like bringing May in for an inning where I think that was when Javi was leading off, but it was more of the bottom of the order. And bringing Loop in for an inning where you're expecting to face a pinch hitter, so hand selected bat who's going to get a match, good matchup. And then the top of the Cubs order, like, those should be probably flip flopped. Got lucky, pulled it off, but whatever. I, I, I almost know. feel like they went to loop so that Jason Hayward wouldn't come into pitch, but who in their right mind has ever feared Jason Hayward? Granted, he got the walk off today, but. Yeah, but an- the Mets the Mets had an intentional walk to put hit, to give him an at bat to get the walk off. Clearly, this we don't fear Jason Hayward if we. If we walked Eric Sogard to face him, <laughs> that is imagine Eric imagine Sogard. That. Imagine going back to like 2010 and being like, the Mets are gonna in a couple years walk Eric Sogard to face Jason Hayward like, with a righty on the mound. Yeah, like, <laughs> like give him every advantage possible, and we still want to face him. Which brings us now to I guess Edwin Diaz too. Like he was still fine. I don't blame him at all. He hit the guy in the no. tenth. We've said this about Diaz before. He is not good coming out for a second inning, especially when he sits down. Whatever the numbers are, they're not great. Dude, the second you get through the top of the tent and you don't score a run, that game is over. You 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 need to have a Herculean effort to find a way to win that game, especially with how juiced up the Cubs came off the field there, and then you hit the first batter, and obviously... With the man on second, nobody else. The guy in first means next to nothing. I honestly, even though he hit him, I probably would have just intentionally walked him just to put more forces on the bases. Because, again, it means fucking nothing. But, uh, oh, by the way, the Cubs were team bunt. Did you notice that? I did see that. I they did. bunted the guy over the third and it fucking worked. Thank God Pete ate shit because he would have wheeled and deals and threw the third base and he would not have gotten hobby by his <laughs> He house. almost threw it away at first, too, because yeah. he was still oh, slipping somehow. He's the slipperiest <laughs> man in the world. And I think even that play has been like a uh, little bit of a microcosm. Look at that. That word SAT word of the day for I just still find that one this time at the end this time yes, at night I know I threw that out there but like for the Mets season because even that play he was trying to do too much just get the out move on it is what it is that's what the entire Mets team was doing and that's what it felt like in the last inning towards the end of the game everyone's pressing everyone's trying to do too much like you said they put the target on their own backs and it seems like it's really really gotten to them and they're just not playing the baseball that they usually are like Lindor in that last inning the at bat was horrendous. Even though he walked, it was a horrible at bat. He horrible. swung at two balls. He so should walk. he walked on six pitches or whatever. Bad. It was. it was so bad. McNeil didn't have a good at bat. Um, no one had just, good at bats. Yeah, even like Dom's at bat, like he missed a couple. Like just he missed a couple pitches, and he still hit the ball in the screws. It didn't yeah. have the right outcome, but he put the barrel on the baseball just on the ground which we have to try to avoid as much as physically possible game three i think that's enough i've had enough of game three it left a terrible taste in my mouth the mets stunk uh you put mets suck shit it's pretty obvious it's kind of how it felt which then honestly let's just talk about game two because this is the game that just get out of the way just get out of the way because i turned it off in the fourth inning because we saw jd davis's defense continue to look pretty horrendous awful and that's why he didn't start today even though he had you know a decent game for us offensively but and he got a pinch hit and he put hit the ball in the screws again how yeah. what the, what kind of fucking curse is this that jd davis can't stop hitting and he can't he can't throw the ball to first base no and it was it, sh- it was shown in game two it was shown in game two specifically because he made some ga- errors in game one or made one or two i think two maybe and he made a couple more in game two and it just it 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 snowballed the rest of the game because the game was relatively close to start it was okay we were doing good until the blow up afterwards like seven innings seven runs in the fourth inning but even after the seven runs we were still in the game like the Mets were still competitive there that next inning and then Pete hit the home run Pete hit the yeah. mammoth home run that went like yeah. 500 feet we were right freaking there and then <laughs> it's the tra- Taylor Hildenberger show yeah he he as good as he looked in the start against the Rockies he looked about as bad as he possibly could have against the Cubs and I think that's why he got sent down right for um he he mostly got sent down just because he threw so many pitches yesterday that he wasn't going to be used for three days anyway and he has options get the new guy up got Foley up there ate some innings you're going to see this bullpen start to really churn now that the Mets are actually playing most days of the week instead of having three rainouts so there's going to be a lot of fa- new names and new faces coming to this team basically on a weekly basis. So there's going to be a lot to keep track of. We're happy to help you do it here. Yeah, Lindor hit his first home run as Met. But how much of that get glossed over? We're excited about that for like a half hour. I turned on the game literally like five minutes late, and I go, I missed his first home run. Are you kidding me? I turn it on, and I go, this is what I get to watch the rest of the day? I thought this was like this the sign of like, here it is. We've been looking for it. We thought that it was going to be the Philly series. Then the Rocky series came and go, we snuck two out of three. Maybe it's going to be that. Then you go and you get swept by the Cubs and you go, oh, no, we have not found it yet. Uh, Peterson. Yeah, Peterson's just, he's what he is. Sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not. He's a young pitcher. He doesn't get a ton of whiffs. He doesn't get a ton of strikeouts. He doesn't throw especially hard. The stuff is okay. Sometimes it'll be good. Sometimes it'll be bad. This year, he's had two of each. What's your thoughts on Rojas 
playing JD at third on a Peterson start. Awful. Really terrible decision. I can't even begin to imagine why he would ever think of doing that, dude. Same with a Taiwan Walker start. Taiwan Walker, and we'll get I've got some notes on Taiwan for game one, but Taiwan mostly this season has been sinker slither and he's been trying to get ground balls. And it just I can't I can't understand why J- I j- it's hard to play a guy on your team when he's such a one-dimensional player. Like, you're not going to do it. Like, this week, the Rocky, the Astros went to Colorado, and Jordan Alvarez was on the bench. Like, J.D. Davis is not the bat that Jordan Alvarez is. There's no way that you can allow him to play the field on a regular basis. You just can't. Dude, Nelson Cruz doesn't touch the field when the Twins play in the National League, and Nelson Cruz is unbelievable at the plate, even better than Jordan. No, Nelson Cruz is also an AARP member. <laughs> yes, so it's, we're not... This is, this is different. J.D.'s in the prime of his life. Nelson Cruz is... And he's collecting social security they along probably, with his game checks. They probably play the same amount of quality <laughs> outfield innings, let's oh be honest. My God. Dude, Jay, I almost think that J.D. Davis at this point would be better than the outfield in the third base. At least in the outfield, he can do less damage. I've been thinking of that, but then you lose where you can put Dom. <laughs> Dom at third base, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't freaking know, man. It's, dude, I, just, I can't turn on the game and see J.D. Davis playing third. Maybe during the Grom starts because no one touches the ball anyway. But maybe one day when Syndergaard comes back, Carrasco too. But he just... You, David Peterson needs everything to be perfect. J, David Peterson starts like most of them are going to be like lottery tickets. Like they're just every ball in play is a scratch off. You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know how hard it's going to be hit, but they're all going to be in play. So we got to make every single play we can. And when you don't make them, you give him nothing to stand on. Yeah, he needs he needs, and it's not like a anything against him. It's just he is a pitch to contact guy. Peterson is a fine back of the rotation guy. He's going to eat innings. He's going to have his days. And sometimes he's not going to have his days. When he doesn't have his days, the defense needs to be there because you need to do everything possible that you can to keep this attainable. I literally, after the fourth inning, after the debacle, I turned it off because I said, all right, it's about nine o'clock. My night's not like over. I have things I could do. I could, I watched uh, Sasquatch on Hulu. I, I moved my car. I had, things, <laughs> I went to the grocery God. store, grocery store. I went to the bodega, picked up some snacks. I had a productive night. I put it off to the side and I said, this game's over with it was an embarrassing performance the team had no juice no life no juice no life lazy got embarrassed by a terrible cubs team they were laughing they were having fun like that's the kind of thing that i would have loved and this is where i think the mets are really lacking that asshole dude they're lacking that just complete dick who's like we're not fucking doing this someone's got to throw something someone's got to break something i don't know this team's just dead and i know they're happy-go-lucky guys but where's the asshole i need someone to be pissed feels like nobody's pissed but i don't i don't think that it's that good to be showing enough showing any negative emotion in april i really still don't the team is still like they're only they're only 500 we've played 14 games like this is the equivalent of what like a game of an NFL season? I don't even know. I'm I mean, we're not even head. a tenth of the way through the season. It's 14 games. We're 162. We're still not a tenth of the way, but like, it's just, it's hard not to get, we're not overreacting. We are, but we're not overreacting. This we is still, as if we're in the, this is if we're in the middle of the second quarter of our second NFL game. That's how early in season is. Otherwise, if, if, if the Jets were 0-1 and then someone, then someone came to the sidelines and broke a chair in the middle of the second quarter, I would, I would be like, that's too much. But listen, you have to tone it back a little bit. Listen, how many times, you can't compare the Mets to the Jets, though, because the Jets have zero, uh, what's the thing I'm looking for? Prediction outcomes. What, uh, what's the word? What, math? <laughs> no, what's, I can't even think of the word. I'm so mad. Expectations. That's the word. Oh, expectations. Fuck you. The Jets have no rico- expectations. You're giving me a ricochet shot yeah. this time of night? The Jets have no expectations. After this series, you jerk off? Listen, it's like, you know, when you're a team that's expecting to do big things, these are like the games that you have to win. Again, I talked about with the Rocky series, like three, three wins would have been big, but it's not the end of the world. Losing three here to the Cubs is bad because this is a Cubs team that everyone else is going to beat up on. Everyone else is going to beat them in the division. You're losing games. And the Cubs have looked bad, but they are an average team. Like they're 500 now. They'll probably end up around 78 to 82 wins if I was a bet if I was a betting man. Their pitching is but so bad. Their, the guys their pitching is a, there, but their pitching is annoyingly bad like we saw in this freaking series where Trevor Williams will go out there and just throw these bullshit change-ups out of the strike zone, and you're just over-aggressive because you think you're going to hit a low fastball, and it just goes. Like, these guys suck, but they're like, they have something. Like, I don't know. The Cubs still have smart people running the organization, even though their owner's a cheap rat. I saw a stat, uh, not a stat, um, Advocates for Minor Leaguers, a good Twitter account to follow. They, they uncover a lot of the nonsense that minor leaguers have to deal with on a regular basis. And there are six teams in baseball that don't provide, have not provided housing for their minor leaguers at the alternate site. The Cubs were one, the Rangers, the Tigers, the Twins, the Reds, 
and the Cleveland baseball team, otherwise known as the Indians. And I'm, uh, I, this is nonsense. I'm, ta- I'm taking shots at the Cubs owner's generosity right now. <laughs> but... We're pissed about that we got absolutely rinsed by the Chicago uh, Cubs. How could you? We got rinsed. We did get rinsed. Uh, we got waxed. Yeah, we we got waxed. Literally, I think that might be the title of the episode. We got wa- the Mex- we Mets got waxed, got waxed. Who, by the me? Chicago freaking Cubs. Tweeting about Josh Van Meter yesterday because I was so pissed off at the Mets game. <laughs> but I want to close the book on game two. The last thing I want to talk about. Yeah, I want to lead you Why? into this. The fuck did Miguel Castro come in the game yesterday? Who the fuck is this making this shit up as we go along? Your, make your army throw two innings. You can bring him in for one, not two. You, Castro? Castro arguably has been the Mets' best reliever this season. And you have him pitching in a game when you've already given up 14 runs. You've given, 14 up two, to you've given up two touchdowns and Miguel Castro is on the fucking mount. Are you fucking serious if he would have blown the game today i would have gotten in my car and driven straight back to queens <laughs> and just grabbed rojas by the shirt why'd you do that why'd you do that you made him through you made him throw almost 20 pitches in the game it didn't even fucking matter yeah i oh, mean I'm like sorry. i'm yelling i'm yelling it's just like <laughs> it comes back though like the decision making we said this early and we were worried about like we don't understand what the process is right now and it's only got this, it's only gotten no more confusing idea what the process is it's even, only gotten more confusing oh uh, like freak like i saw a tweet today about like oh i guess god the lineup is fixed why can't we hit i don't fucking know but the lineup isn't even fixed like i don't know we get a pilar and vr hitting the same day let's let's go let's talk about game one a little bit just just wrap this get get through this fuck the cold i fucking hate the cold playing baseball in the cold should be illegal why did the mets go to denver and chicago in april are you I kidding no i don't know how that's who why did mlb schedule Two road series in the coldest ballparks like, in baseball. We want you guys to play six games in the freezing cold in a row. Also, what the fuck happened to day games in Wrigley? Why are we I playing have no every... Idea. First off, night games in Wrigley look like dog shit. The, the, the camera looks terrible. Wrigley Field is an incredible stadium, and it should be shown off. But they still have the same lights that they had back in 1908 when the, the black cat ran across the field, even though that was the 60s. But they're still using the same lighting. It looks... Hor- There's dead spots in the outfield. It's just dark. <laughs> I mean, <I've- laughs> it's crazy that we play night games there. It, I, it may have snowed at some point during the day in Chicago every day this week. If not at least two of the three days the Mets have been there. Like, why is this happening? Why are we playing in the cold? You can't play baseball in the cold. I understand the Cubs have to play home games at some point in April. Like, that's just how it works. <laughs> I don't want to be a part of them. <laughs> why is it not the fucking Milwaukee Brewers or the Fuck Minnesota them. Twins? Why has it uh, got to be us? How's the weather been in New York the last few days? Is it oh, playable? it's been playable. It's been 50, and I think, like... You know, it's been, ball, oh no, me. I, I lied. The other day, I played basketball with uh, not the expert Drew. Shout out on the podcast, fellow <laughs> YouTuber. We played basketball. It was like 65, 70 degrees out. It was beautiful. <sighs> glorious yeah it was a great day i went outside you know it's a nice day if i'm outside yeah marco's days without going outside but let's just i want to get i got some taiwan walker notes because i know that's what the people are here for these days of course they love a good james breakdown of the pitchers that guy worked so damn hard man on on tuesday night he worked so freaking hard also he had a full week between his starts due to like the the changes in the rotation how they manage the off day also i don't like how the mess manage the off day i'll say that too right now even coming off a double header like they could have kept guys going on five days rest and to move everyone up a day besides get, not give Lucchese this freaking start. But whatever. I don't – whatever. I, f- nah, whatever. Whatever. 91 pitches and three and two thirds innings. That's a shit ton. Even all of that, the Cubs only had two hits. The Cubs had two damn hits and they drew six freaking walks. They only put two balls in play over 95 miles an hour, which is astounding based on the fact that he was chased in the fourth. And he certainly changed up his attack this game, which I think ties into the fact that, as crazy as this is, this could be just a pure – nonsense connection but jd davis was on the field instead of vr and Guillaume, so you know your infield defense is a little bit worse he went hardcore with the four seamers again today compared to the sinkers he went 41 percent four seamers versus 21 percent sinkers almost a complete flip from his last start and basically it's a little bit more but his first start season was a little bit in the middle and the control was spotty he really wasn't finding that four seam location he was missing inside he was missing outside he was missing high he just wasn't pinpointing it, it wasn't bad but it wasn't like the way we've seen the last few times out when he was very effective And he sat 94, he touched 96. It was a little bit of a drop from his last two starts where he was sitting 95, 96-ish and touching 97. But this was his coldest start of the year, so we'll give that. And the guy, he got fucking squeezed, man. The Mets got fucking squeezed that day. How in God's name have we had Joe West, Lipka, whatever all these schmuck umpires are? How do we have them every fucking series? Every series. I think when things are going bad, you know, it just feels like this. Like every single thing goes wrong. That game... 
on Tuesday night, it felt like every single thing went wrong. And even when we got to the end of the game after an awful feeling game and Frank, Francisco Lindor had the at-bat, it just felt like something good was going to happen. And nothing good happened. I, the the most positive thing I can come from, take from game one is that Miguel, or Miguel Rojas, that's on the Marlins, Luis Rojas got tossed from the game for the first time in his career, saw a little energy, saw a little life out of Luis yeah, Rojas. It, no, it was warranted. Doing yeah, nothing. stone-faced. Doing stone-faced. nothing. Stone-faced. So it was good to show like a little bit, but like... I also, still think I... I, if, I'm not going to hate then Rojas for the lack of showing emotion. I kind of like when the baseball manager keeps the even keel. Leader of men, you know? Like, keep steady hand, steady hand. But uh, Just to go back on this, because I was searching for this while you were talking about Taiwan Walker and the errors and everything. So, Tim Healy put out this tweet. Before J.D. Davis's error, two and two, two-thirds innings, zero hits, zero runs, two walks, five Ks, 46 pitches. After the error, 45 pitches, one inning, two hits, three runs, two earned, four walks, two Ks. Oh my god! It's a it's really hard crazy. to pitch the way you want to, especially Tyon Walker, who's clearly made an effort to try to be cut, get more ground balls this year. It's really hard to pitch the way you want to when you have no faith in the guys behind you, and that's possibly we we will never know. Tyron Walker's not going to say, "Ah, oh, JD fucked me. I couldn't pitch." Yeah, the way no, I you wanted can't. To. You can't say that. But there's a clear and obvious there was something that changed. And it, it also he got he did start to get squeezed a little bit, and you saw him even chirping the umpire, which I love to see because fuck umpires. I think that's a <laughs> sentiment around the league. They stink at their job, but it, it changed the, the entire robots. game. It changed the entire game. It did. But also at the same time, JD Davis has to make those plays. He has to. And yeah. there's no more excuses. There's no more oh the the off days. It's cold. Like it's cold for the other teams. It's the other teams have off days. There's just. Uh, it feels like there's just a pile and pile of excuses as to like why the Mets aren't playing well when really it should just come down to like at this point they're just playing bad baseball there's no more excuses to be had they are playing bad baseball Mets are just playing bad baseball it's bad 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 baseball no way no other way around it but yeah I mean game one's bad I'm gonna go on my little rant here about the Mets now because I've been waiting for this for about you know 30 30 40 minutes or so but preach we got notes. We got the bullet points. Bad defense. Atrocious defense. From just about everybody this series has looked bad. From Lindor making some errors, which is uncharacteristic. From Michael Conforto still having an inability to throw the ball in and hit a cutoff man or make an accurate throw at all. Pitchers aren't backing up behind home plate. J.D. Davis looks like he's never actually played the position of third base right now. I like it's Kevin Pillar not getting the ball. The little things that a winning team does, the Mets are not doing right now defensively. And like, I know backing up home plate doesn't sound like something, but that's the difference between a guy maybe going from second to third on a ball that's a shit throw from the outfielder that they're trying to get the guy at the plate. But second to third now, if there's less than two outs, a fly ball gets that run in. Instead, the guy goes to third or straight at second. These are little things. If you're a good team, Mm -hmm. you have to do this. And the Mets are not doing the little things. And this is what makes me concerned about Luis Rojas is because when they're not doing the little things, it really does come down to the managing and the coaching because the players, of course, they have to be able to play the game. But it also comes down to the preparation. It comes down to if they're ready for these games and feels like the Mets aren't ready. I mean, you can even go to the offensive side. The at-bats have been atrocious. Whatever the approach is at the plate is, take it, put it in a garbage can, light it on fire. I don't want to see this approach anymore because it's so, so bad. What, you want to put it in a garbage can, light it on fire? Yes. You want to take the trash and burn it? Yes, I want to take the trash and burn it. Get rid of it. I don't want it to exist anymore. Send it to Pluto. Send it to a fake planet. Send I don't it care. To Pluto. Get it out of here. Fuck Wrigley Field at night. I hate that place. It looks like shit. I don't want to ever play a night game at Wrigley place. Field it again. Like shit. God damn, Mark. That's a that's a pillar of baseball history right there. It's a I great won't stadium, for this. except at night. The fucking lights don't work. It's 2021. <laughs> I know you have cheap-ass owners. Get the some fucking, fucking lights. You lights paid for goddamn 20 scoreboards. Put some fucking lights out there. Also, with the way the Mets are playing baseball, strikeouts, walks. I can't even put home runs, but it looks like they're trying no. to and they just can't hit it far enough over the fence. May, maybe one day. Maybe one day we'll hit a home run, even though we've gotten a couple like this series. But <laughs> <laughs> strikeout, walks, boring baseball. No one's Bo- driving in anybody with runners in uh, actually, position. Actually, I think you meant to say boring fucking baseball. <laughs> boring fucking baseball. Exactly. Boring fucking baseball. Like I think I put out a tweet. I was like, this series feels like it has been going on consistent, like Tuesday night. All just continued into Wednesday night, just continued into Thursday night. It's all been one nightmare of a game. It's like a Grateful Dead. It's like a Grateful Dead album. It's just one song. Just one song that won't end. And I just wanted this. It every even tonight, like the game was just so long and boring. It wasn't an entertaining game to watch. And not oh, even because the awful. Mets were losing. If the Mets were winning this game, I probably would have the same thing a little 
calmer for sure. But I'd be like, my God, that game was just tough to watch on TV. Nobody was doing anything. Feels like the same game since Tuesday. And I pray to God, this is not an indication of how the season is going to be. No, because that's, watching... not, that's not, this is an indication of how the season's going to be. I want everyone to remember for a moment, 2018, spring of 2018, when the Mets were 10 and 1, 11 and 1. I'm Mickey Calloway, the best young manager in baseball. The team was playing their balls off. What a great start to the season that was. Everyone remembers how that went. The first, the first two weeks of the season has little to no indication of what the rest of the season is going to be. Remember the Tigers two years ago? How they started off like, it was like 10-9 and nine or something, and then they went, on, they went on to win like 43 games the rest of the season. I feel like the team you always have to bring up now is the Nationals in 2019. Yeah, for Literally sure. Literally were the worst team in baseball come May, middle of May, and they won the friggin' World Series. So it's not the end of the world, but I just don't want this to be any, any indication of how the season is going to go because this watching this baseball, I put this, it's a little crazy. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm going a little crazy here. But it's less enjoyable than watching when the Mets flat out stunk because we're supposed to be good and we're playing you bad. Spoiled brat, you shut you sh- you shut your mouth. We're a good team and we're playing so bad. At least when we were bad teams, I knew we were gonna stink. I knew we were gonna lose. I hate the idea of like we should be better and we're just not there. I know yeah, it's you, coming. You, you wouldn't have this beautiful raw emotion. You wouldn't be just spitting this truth on your on our podcast right now if the Mets were awful and it's supposed to be awful. Like I'm sure there'll be the Orioles podcast and the Tigers podcast <laughs> out there. There's no there's no viv- vivacious emotion. Their face doesn't get red. Their hair doesn't get messed up in a game in April. That's that's because we're supposed to be good. That's what we're here for. And we're going to continue to be here for that. I'm sweating. And we I'm have a worked big... Up. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of sweating, getting too. getting worked up we... about these Mets games, man. I'm getting you had, like a sol- you had like a soliloquy. I think I caught some iambic pantameter. Ooh, nice. But, I like that. <laughs> but all we got to do now is take care of fucking business against the Nationals. We gotta, we gotta, we're against our rival. We have our two best pitchers coming to the mound in the next two days. You got to take care of business. This team has two. Good hitters in the lineup. I cannot wait until Starling Castro makes me eat my words with like a, with like an eight for nineteen well, series. Soto isn't even playing. I don't think. Are you serious? Soto's hurt. Oh, when did the this week? You're yeah. Fine. So they have so, one competent hitter. One good player. It's they Trey Turner, hitter. who owns the Mets, who's sick. And so help me God, if Aaron Loop faces Trey Turner at all this series, I am going to jump off the roof. I'm going to lose it because... Don't, don't jump off the roof. Just go right to City Field. Voice your, voice I'm, your frustration. I'm going to yell out at the, at the stadium. I'm going to say, hey, hey, where's Luis? You assholes. Where is he? <laughs> going to pull up in your car. You motherfuckers. Why are you doing this? I'm going to sit outside his house. I'm going to beat my car horn all night until I get an answer because the decisions we're making are so bad. But yes, move on. We're on to the next series. I'm just, I'm a little hot. We've got to beat the fucking Nationals. They're the Nationals. They're, they're not good. They're another not good team. They're not good. Another team past their prime. A team that's not going to really scare you with any starting pitching. We've got Eric Fetty on the hill tomorrow. I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray on his downfall. <laughs> I pray on his downfall. Oh I God. want to make Eric Fetty feel pain. <laughs> I want him to not want to pitch anymore. We have such a gift that we're getting to face the Nationals for a weekend series. We're not going to see Max Scherzer. We're seeing Fetty, Ross, and Corbin. Please, please, please get some hits. Just get some timely hits. My God, please. And we've got what? DeGrom, Stroman, and... And Taiwan. That's, I mean, like... We're, now pitching on regular rest. Got the, we've got, got the advantage. you got to do it. <laughs> have to beat them. I mean, you don't. Mm-hmm. You have to, but you don't. It's it, whatever. It's the same no. old, like, uh, cliches of baseball, you know? No, no, no. Tomorrow... I'm going to say this right now. First time I'm going to break this out in this podcast. Tomorrow's a must-win game. And you were getting on me for saying if this is any indication, not even 10% of the series. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying these last three games are predictive in any way of how the Mets season is going to go. But I'm saying tomorrow, off a three-game skid, playing dog shit baseball, Jacob DeGrom versus Eric Fetty, tomorrow's a must-win game. I am com- <sighs> I wanted to go to the game tomorrow night and even like Saturday, but I'm a little worried that it's going to get ugly at City Field because if this team comes out and lays a goose egg. Go tomorrow. Come on. They're not laying a goose egg tomorrow. we got two best pitchers on the mound. Go to the game. Have it's some gonna, fun. It's going to be bad, man. Enjoy I, yourself. Yeah, everyone's Mets Twitter is not doing well. We're the positive guys. We're not doing that great. I mean, like there, there are way more negative people. Like we, at the end of the day, like we'll rant and we'll say our things and we'll have our issues. But at the end of the day, like we know this team's going to be okay. But that's not how the average fan thinks because – the average fan doesn't think most of the time. It's just an emotion. Nice. It's just, it's just you know, what's yeah, on the top s- of their brain right now. 
We've been spitting low key poetry here. I'm gonna fucking drink before every single podcast. I'm gonna have a little Captain and Coke every single time because <laughs> I'm I, like, it's just we need to hit, man. We need to hit at least. Hit, please hit for Degrom. Please, please put up a freaking ten spot against Eric freaking <laughs> Fetty. Please, for the love of God, Jacob please. Degrom has not murdered please. any teammates. Please. <laughs> please, it might be different after tomorrow. It might be different. Who knows? I just, you know, I'd even like to see the Mets just swing out of their shoes tomorrow. Just go up there and just take fucking war hacks. The best, the best thing I saw today was in uh, in what the first or second inning that Ronnie and Gary were talking about three finger Mordecai, oh, Mordecai Brown, Mordecai Brown, Mordecai three finger Brown. I did not know that story. Thank God, at least when the Mets play bad baseball, we are blessed to have the best announcing crew in the sport just taking us through a journey with them. Blessed. Mordecai Three Finger Brown. Mordecai Brown was born, was born in 1876. This man would be 200 years old. <laughs> he, had, he had a 2.06 career ERA. Dude, shit outside. Oh I mean, <laughs> literally took dumps outside. Yeah, I mean, uh, I even noticed, started to notice they're getting a little like restless too with like everything. Yeah, they're not, they're not happy. With even like team. Ron today was like a little nitpicky about uh, Pete because they, they asked like Pete like, "What'd you think about the home run that you hit the other night?" And he's like, "I thought it went 500 feet." Ron's like, "I would have wish you. I wish you would have said I don't know." Like it was like, "All right, Ron, like <laughs> hey, let's listen. Like we're not gonna nitpick everything here. Like it's okay for him to say he crushed that baseball. Like I know they're playing shit game. I think Ron's whole thing was like, you guys are playing bad. Like." stop thinking about you like this team needs to step up and i'm like i think you're looking a little too much into it i think pete alonzo is very much a team guy from the way that it seems there's one thing you can't deny these guys are all rooting for each other they all want to do well and i think that's why there's even more pressure is that they don't how did you go how how did you go from like angry sweating upset cursing to like i'm gonna be really sweet and sappy these guys love each other because trying so hard we just lost three games in a row (laughs) the series is over we moved on to the nationals now i'm feeling good again we're gonna be oh, fine. Okay. We're gonna be fine. We're gonna be fine. We're gonna be fine. But I ha- you have to uh you watch have you, oh you watch Rick and Morty. Of course. It's like the episode where they like go into that other dimension where it's just like the worst versions of themselves, but they have to get rid yeah. of like the toxin in order <laughs> yeah. to like be okay. That's what this yeah. episode was of the podcast. We just right, we, we, had to, we had to throw out every single bad thing that was in our body, including watching those nine hours of Mets baseball that was atrocious nine this was at least at least ten and a half felt like <laughs> these were long it, games it felt like when I closed my eyes at night I was watching more Mets baseball like it, it was haunting me have you been sleeping are you okay <laughs> I mean from the looks of it with my eyes it looks like I haven't been sleeping oh my god but we had to get rid of the toxins we had to get rid of all the bad the negative juju coming into the national series there's no reason we shouldn't beat the nationals there really isn't no reason there's no reason that I can think of conceivably in my logical head that the Mets can lose to the Nationals in the next two days. There's no way. We're gonna. We're just gonna win. We're just gonna win. It's that simple. Just put it out there. Put out the wins. We're gonna be fine. Episode eight was a different one for sure. Uh, we're not even doing a bad take because the bad take is just straight up Mets baseball. Mets baseball yeah, was a bad, bad take. Takes. Of the entire. I've honestly, yeah, I've honestly been making a conscious effort to stay off Twitter just because of how negative all most of the Mets fans are. I don't need to see any of this stuff. Yeah, I, honestly, and even even some of the positivity started rubbing the wrong way. Dacomo's on pace for 107 wins tweet the other day. I was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. Don't need to see I, that right now. Like let's I don't want to see that. Let's just watch Mets baseball and in the moment you can have your say your piece, but then after it, let's go to bed. Tomorrow's a new day. And I think that's what the Mets need to do. That's what we both need to do. And I think that is the perfect way to end episode number 8 here of the Mets Up podcast. Your co-hosts, James Shiano, Jeter Had No Range, Giraffe Neck Mark, Mark Luino. You know where to find us on Twitter. You know where to find the Mets Up podcast, where we're going to be posting a lot over there. Mets Up on Twitter and Instagram. Follow us on YouTube where you can watch the podcast. And if you made it this far, you already missed it, but go watch the YouTube video. It's, it's going to be a good one. You're going to see a lot of reactions. And you're going to see me <laughs> sweating, literally sweating my forehead. Yeah, you can see, you can see that right here. A little shiny, a little shiny. But uh, <laughs> listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. And that's going to be it for us guys here. Episode 8, Messed Up Podcast. Hopefully our next episode, we're talking about a sweep over the Nationals. Peace out.